Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. We got an exciting night for video games. Welcome everyone to February 1982. And instead of doing the usual moving forward, we actually get to go back. One of the games that we didn't have, we now have. This is Aliens Eggs for the Radio Shack TRS-80. And thank you so much, Punk Rock Biker, for giving us this one, making sure it works for us. We finally get to check out Aliens Eggs and re-rate it. Let's see what it's like by Yves Limpreur or Micro 2000 at some point in the beginning of February 1982. That's right, it's the Retro Rewind. I already described Alien Alien's Egg as a Mooncresta variant, so it takes the tropes from Mooncresta. Oh, nice. Micro 2000. All right, we're ready to play. Does it use joystick? Yes, we're here in Belgium. And do like the Belgians do. All right, let's do instructions. Break eggs and destroy aliens. Hey, just like in the arcade. Use arrows to move the ship, space bar to fire. If you get over 2,000, you get a new opportunity to redock the first stage of your ship. Good luck. <laughs> Look at all the high scores. All by uh, Eves. Ives. Don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. And let's go. How many players do you want? Let's go one. I'm really digging the TRS-80 intros. They're so cool. They're going above and beyond, pushing the system that, it, honestly, it's like the uh, the Apple II. The Apple II just didn't die. It's like the TRS-80 won't die with games like this. So fun. All right, we're in, and joystick does work. So you blow up the eggs, and then an alien comes out of the eggs, and then comes at you. I'm sure they're going to give us different variations of aliens. But show of hands, who loves this aesthetic for the TRS-80? With pixels so large, you don't have to use your imagination. You know exactly what things are. I want to see if they do a docking procedure just like in Mooncresta. Controls are very simple. Move left, right, and fire just like in... Oh, whoa! That is a cool explosion. And now we start with the second phase since we died on the last alien. Instead of docking to increase your firepower, this means we have, yeah, double. Oh, all the aliens are back, though. Okay. After playing arcade and computer arcade games with a lot of firepower, it feels a little bizarre to have the one shot at a time playing. It takes a little bit to get used to. Okay, so we're doing it. I haven't seen the docking sequence yet. I wonder if it only does your upgrade once you die. And the background scrolling of the stars is a really nice touch. It's very bizarre playing the TRS-80 and ex experiencing scrolling, or... Whoa, all the eggs hatch if you take too long. Okay. <laughs> nice and easy. Okay, it does keep going. I don't think there's a docking sequence. I think you only upgrade whenever you die. So you, uh, I'm, I'm guessing to keep the, the, the game with one game mode rather than multiple. Yep, still going. Yep, so no docking sequence. Uh-oh, not good. Oh, wow, yeah, there's there's no moving up and down. So once they reach the bottom, that's it. Oh, yeah, good shout-out with Phoenix. I can see that. So last round, higher firepower. But actually, no, same firepower, slower and wider. But amazing. First time we've ever played any Mooncresta variant on the TRS-80. Wow, and the explosion is so cool. 
this feels like a big five software release for the TRS-80. So there you go, there's Alien's Eggs. Oh man, we definitely are rewriting this one. So of all the games we played, this is, uh, I would even say uh, above average. Um, well, it doesn't have the docking sequence, it's, it's somewhere around the three, three and a half stars. Honestly, what's pushing it ahead is it's on the TRS-80 that it's doing all this for us. So uh, it, it's so polished, I'm gonna say three and a half stars. Yeah, it's not the normal game that you would be playing in 1982. All right, so now let's go back where we were and continue our quest. We last left off with Raster Blaster, the best, one of the best pinball games for the uh, Atari uh, 800. And let's see what our next game is. We're next going to the Commodore VIC-20 and here's a Road Rally. Let's start with the artwork for Road Rally. This is part of the Super Games Pack 2, along with uh, Cannonade, Block It, and Skittles, which I think we played a few of those. Skittles was the bowling game. So this one is no other information. We're just going to pop it and play <laughs> this one by Commodore Business Machines in the UK. So at some point at the beginning of February 1982, let's go to England and play some Road Rally. A game for one against the clock, enter the track width and press return. F1 to go right, F7 to go left. That is very bizarre control scheme. I don't know why I'm surprised with controls anymore. I mean, we've already seen so much, but this is weird. F1 and F7, all right, I'll, I'll play along. <laughs> Commodore Electronics Limited. All right, so we do track width, five to 15. All right, we'll do 10. Oh, wait, do you do 10 to... Okay, 10 to 15, I guess. There we go. And we're in. Oh, okay, so it's technically not a driving game. It's more of just a... <laughs> move forward. Oh, we got a new best time. New game start. And we can change it up. Okay, let's do 5 to 15 this time. Make it wider, maybe? There we go, yeah. Wider than it was before, but it's... Road Rally is honestly a throwback to the 70s, one of the first scrolling racing games we ever saw in the arcades that wasn't even using a microprocessor, where it's just constantly moving forward in the the car. You just have to move left and right. It's, it's just like this without crashing into the walls. This reminds me of a, a game that would be a type-in game, but no, it's part of a compilation. A few of the Commodore games we've been playing is the single game in the compilation rather than all of them at the same time. <laughs> so we're rating them only on what is this one game worth in 1982 or uh, how it plays. And it very simple controls, albeit weird, you know, F1, F7. Well, we get the idea. Okay, cool. Road, road Rally is pretty fun. For 1982, I'd say it's average. Maybe even subpar, two and a half stars. Oh, uh, because the scrolling's pretty nice. I'll say two and a half stars. It's pretty simplistic, but still, still pretty, uh, it's a good time. All right, after Road Rally, let's see what our next game is. <laughs> oh, yeah, the sweater in the commercial, nice. <laughs> uh, two and a half, yeah, I'm being generous as well. All right, let's see what our next game is after Road Rally. We're still on the VIC-20, and this is Rocks 2. This one's slightly influential. No, well, not the game itself, just who made the game. We have no box for Rocks 2. Let's pop it and play Rocks 2. This is one of the first games by Jeff Mentor, by Llamasoft, way in the early time of Llamasoft. If you're not familiar with Jeff Mentor, you will if you keep watching the channel. Oh, wow, the game begins. We're in. All right, so the way this works is we're the center tower. We have three shots. We're supposed to just shoot the rocks <laughs> before they come down. So I got a tower that can shoot there. Oh, it didn't hit the... Oh, there we go. Got one. So you just have three shots moving. Looks like 45 degree angle, 90 degree angle, and then the other 45. And that's it. Very slow, very to fire, though. And you also have this, like, super button. If you push the super button, then everything just explodes. And I don't see where you have... An, where, where your number of the super button is. I know you have a limited supply, though. Let's just keep using it. Go! Oh. Attack wave one complete. This is another one that's giving me type in vibes. Go! Yes. All you're doing is protecting the surface. So rocks fall down. Oh. And they slowly start whittling away. Oh, I got him at the last second. And if one of them breaks through the surface, then you haven't protected the planet. 
I don't know what the lore is on this one. We, we didn't get a box or a manual, so you, you start making it up. We've heard so much lore already. Oh, am I, is my super out? It is. No, we have to rely on skill alone now. Now, this one's the rate of fire is so slow. Like, this is me pushing as fast as I can to try to shoot. Maybe you could say that you have to practice to get your timing down on the shot. So it's a little bit of skill, but eh, that, that's kind of stretching it. Yeah, I'd say it's still too clunky for the time, and that, that's all it is. That that one screen is Rocks 2. Obviously, based on the first game, Rocks, that was part of a compilation that Jeff Minter did. All right, so uh, of all the games we played, I'd say bad, not pushing too far down, but I'd say two stars. It still isn't as enjoyable, but with the, the way that you control, uh, controls a little bit too bad. <laughs> yeah, you can barely see the shot from the screen. It's so bad. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, the special effects. There you go. All right, so that's Rocks 2. Let's see where we're going now. Our next game is Snakebite for the Apple II. And this one, we got the, the latest ad by Atari. I mean, uh, by Apple. Uh-oh, I hope they're not listening. <laughs> Computer in the world. The latest Apple. My Apple is my manager. There are more people in more places <laughs> even more Santa. things with apples than with any other personal computer in the world. Apple computer. Produktion controller ohne den Apple and Maggie. And of all these people using apples, most had never touched a computer before. This is my apple. Even little kid. Apple, the most personal computer. So there you go. Proof that Santa Claus prefers the Apple over all the other computers out there. All right, let's take a look at the box for Snakebite on the Apple II. Oh, yes, by Sirius. Nice. It's got to be a rockin' snake game or a snake variant, right? Just serious software twist. Looks like you got 48K needed on this. All right. Requires Apple II or 2 Plus. Uses keyboard or Atari uh, or joystick or uh, it doesn't say if it uses an Apple joystick. Snake Bite is the game that works like a charm, a tale of perilous purple plums that's ahead of its time. What? A game that you can sink your teeth into, an antidote for boredom. Snake Bite, fangs a lot, serious software. I don't think we needed to read that, it was a little too cheesy. Let me do have another artwork for Snake Bite. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk, and I did see, for some reason on the Apple, everything was written as demo. I don't know if it came out as a demo first. Whether it's demo or not, we do have the manual for it. Snake Bite by Serious Software. Dig dig to become a master slitherer, insert the snake bite diskette into drive one. How many plums do you want? It's going to ask. And uh, <laughs> what are perilous plums? I guess they bounce around. Okay, they bounce harmlessly around the screen. However, if one makes direct hit with your snake's head, you lose a snake. The first snake will creep out of the snake bin at the bottom center of the screen and maneuver the following keys. Okay, so it uses the keyboard, not the Atari joystick. If you like playing with pre-assigned keys, you can press C. Oh, okay. So when asked the question, you can actually assign any keys you want. Love it when games do that on the computer. The object is to eat all the apples in the room. So it is. It's a snake variant by Sirius Software. You'll lose a snake if you bump into the wall. Yep, yep. We know how to play snake games. Got it. And for scoring, looks like if you're playing with more plums, you get extra points, which I guess they're bouncing around, keeping it, uh, uh, getting in your way. And then uh, for Atari joystick, oh, the Sirius Software Joy Port. If you have your Atari joystick, you can plug it into the Apple II, which I don't think we have. I think we'll be doing keyboard. And then we have uh, other controls. Yes, you have escape key, I think, to pause, which that's kind of ahead of its time. A, a pause key. All right, let's pop in and play some Snake Bite. This is by Chuck Somerville. Released at some point in the beginning of February in 1982. Oh, nice. Chuck Somerville. We are ready. Oh, it went right into it. Now, I'm going to double check and see if the Atari joystick does work, but nothing responding yet. Okay, how many plums? We're gonna go all the way. Two plums. Give us give us it all. We're ready. Oh yeah, it is not working with the joystick. So keyboard only on the Apple. Unless you got the adapter to, to to plug in, which I guess that'd be an extra cost. So it could work with a joystick, but I mean keyboard's a piece of cake. All you're doing is moving the snake left and right using the arrow keys, which is which is pretty good because the left and right are pretty easy to find on the, the Apple keyboard. Yeah, it's Snake. Uh, notice that it's not doing two-player. We played two-player Snake games before, so I'm a little underwhelmed of Sirius. I mean, it is kind of rad. We have this 
retro looking neon theme. Oh, and we go to another level? Let's see what happens then. Oh, okay, so we switch it up and, oh, okay, they go to level by level, so they add obstacles in the way. So now we have a, a bar in front of us. Pick up all the apples, then move on to another level. Okay, so it's giving you the feeling that you're moving or progressing forward in the game. That's something different. But I'd say the two-player mode is the best part of it. Without a two-player mode, <laughs> I went the wrong way. Crash. All right, that's that's pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, wouldn't say I'm impressed for it, but for the time, I'd say it's about average. Typical game that we see. It's not subpar. It's it, it's still fun. Um, three stars, and the usual 1982 game. But that's not all. We have also. Snake bike for the Atari home computer. Kind of like we saw before. So uh, the, the same game, but on a different home computer. Here we go. This is the box on the Atari 800. Still need 48K. The most memory of any home game we've seen. This is the max to play this game. Snakebite, it's the game that works like a charm. A tale of purple plums that's ahead of its time. Any other artwork we have for Snakebite on Atari? Oh, no way, the ad. So the advertisement has, look in the top left corner. This is some mascot for Serious Software. He was part of, I think, Dark Forest is the game, which is a game we couldn't get to run. I tried three different ways and still couldn't get Dark Forest to run, but he's been the mascot of Sirius, that little green goblin in the top left corner. This is a game you can really sink your teeth into. Okay, he's the one who made the stupid pun. And then they have a comic for us. So marketed very well by Sirius. They're going, they're going places. And the manual should be the exact same manual, right? Yeah, okay, same manual as we had before, but now we're playing on Atari. Just alternate versions there. Let's pop in and play some Snake Bite. This is one that's brought to us by Dan Thompson, or converted to Atari by Dan Thompson, in February 1982. No, we've had other mascots. There's one that was on the VIC-20, I think. Uh, good point. Video game mascots, or company mascots. The, 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 the companies that have been putting out consoles have already had mascots. So uh, I'm trying to think, did Atari ever have an official mascot. I don't think Atari did, but Magnavox Odyssey did, and I don't think it t Intellivision did. And I don't even know if Sirius's uh, goblin mascot is official or not. I've just seen him every now and then on Sirius games. Okay, so we're in. Does the joystick work? Oh, it does. Nice. Okay, so we can't select how many plums. We'll go two plums. Now we got joystick controls. Oh, nice. Not only do we have joystick controls, we have absolute joystick controls. So if I move up, the snake goes up. If I go right, the snake goes right. There is no a relative controls like it was on when we played on the Apple. I had to constantly move left and right and know which whatever direction my face, my a snake is facing. I have to go that way. So they switched up the controls, and I guess whatever your flavor, you know, you like relative or absolute controls, whatever is easier. But this one, if I go up, the snake goes up. If I go right, the snake goes right. We crashed, but it's still snake bite. An excellent port of the game, but wait a second, where's the sound? We have sound cranked up, and we always hear sound on the Atari. What's what's up, Atari? Where's the sound for Snake Bite? Even on the death, we don't hear anything. That is a little bizarre. We weren't getting that much from the Apple anyway. We're not missing much. So there you go, another snake variant. Snake Bite. Program. I would say one of the best snake variants if it could have been two player. I'm still going to say uh, for all the games we've seen up to this point, three stars for Snake Bite. A great time for 1982. And with that, let's see what our next game is. From high technology, the computer store. All right, this is Space Rescue on Apple II. This one has one of the most bizarre instances on the channel. Are you ready? Space Rescue comes out in February 1982 from all my sources. There's a Space Rescue for Apple II that comes out in February 1982. When I go online and look up pictures and screenshots, this is what Space Rescue looks like from all the sources that say Space Rescue that came out in 1982. And there's only one Space Rescue that I could find that came out on the Apple. So I saw the screenshots, I'm like, okay, great. Now let's play Space Rescue. This is nuts. Because I boot the game up, and the game says it's by Rod Nelson, and it's by level 10. Nowhere does anyone know anything about Rod Nelson doing this game or this company. So if you were to Google right now, try, try to look at this up. Look up Space Rescue, 
buy on the Apple II, you won't see this game. So uh, I don't even know for sure if this it was out in February 1982, but everybody says February 1982, we had Space Rescue on the Apple II. So I'm going to play it, and this is it. And we're going to give props to Rod. And Rod, if you're out there listening, let me know what happened with this game and when this game actually came out. Because this is pretty cool. This is a, 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 a nice game for 1982. All right, so are we in already? No, it's doing the track mode, like an arcade. So what do we do first? Push a space bar. Oh, we are in. Okay, so this is the same game as like Lunar Rescue or very similar to Lunar Rescue. You leave the ship from the top of the screen once you make your way down and you make a landing, kind of like Lunar Landing, then you make your way back up to the top. All right, here we go. Let's see if we can do it. The only difference is I don't have a shot. All I'm doing is dodging. <laughs> and you have to make it all the way to the spacecraft on the side. So it looks like the spacecraft stays where it is. All right, so dropping down again, moving left and right. I'll go for a higher score this time. Okay, we're in, and now I got to make my way all the way to the right without getting destroyed. I'm trying all the the buttons I have for controls, and yeah, oh, I do have a shot. I do have a shot going up. Okay, I got to remember that. Just like the arcade. Oh, nice! And I got a thruster. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Who knew pushing buttons helps you out? All right, so I cannot slow down. Uh-oh, this isn't looking good. Nope. <laughs> and then I fall to my death. <laughs> In a splattered heap at the bottom. Nice and easy. Oh, barely made that. I don't think I can make it all the way to the right in time. But if you remember Lunar Rescue in the arcade, and we've seen a few other variants, this one's just like that, but an excellent variant at home. There's no way. Yeah, you have to time when you leave of the, or when you land to make the ship come back. So here, let's, let's do this again. As soon as you leave the spacecraft at the top, you have to get your timing down right to land the ship where the spacecraft can be in the right spot. So let's see if I hover a little bit. That's a little bit better. Let's see if we can make it back up. <laughs> yeah, it seems that the the, the left-right controls when you're moving up and down is a little clunkier. It's not a smooth a smooth affair. All right, here we go. Going to the side now. We'll go to the right side. Go, go, go. And see, I should have done more thrusters because now there's no way I'm going to get all the way over to the left and dock with the ship. Yeah, brutally difficult. All right, so there you go. That is Space Rescue. So whether this is the correct Space Rescue or not, uh, we're going to give credit to Rod uh, for that one. At some point in February 1982, of all the games we played, I'd say um, the the way that it plays, the controls aren't as as good, but the gameplay itself is, is, is awesome. It's around three stars, maybe three and a half. Uh, for the Apple II, and considering the other games we've seen, I'll, I'll say three and a half stars for Space Rescue. All right, and with Space Rescue, let's move on to our next game. We're still on the Apple II, and this is Bolo. Let's check out Bolo and see what it's about. Starting with a box by Synergistic Software, or Elvin, E-L-V-Y-N, Futuristic Tank Combat. We are blowing stuff up. Maybe blowing down walls, too. It looks from the front of the box. And on the back, yeah, it's by Elvin Software. Based on the Bolo series Science Fiction Classics by Keith Laumer. So is this a licensed game? The Ultimate Tank Battle Challenge. Only $34.95. And again, $48K. Uh, this is a lot, of, a lot of games that require that much memory. And I'm wondering if in 1982 we're going to see a bump. Well, I know we're going to see a bump because the Commodore 64 is released this year. So I know memory's going to go up, but we're still holding tight with 48K as the max. All right, let's see what else we have for artwork. What does Bolo have? Oh, nothing. Okay, that's that, we got nothing else for Bolo. Let's pop in and play some Bolo. This is by Elvin Software, published by Synergistic Software for the Apple II. Now it says it's a tank game. I'm expecting top-down tank shooting action.
We've already seen some other top-down games, so I'm curious if they're going to change change it up with Bolo. But Synergistic Software, more specifically Elven Software, I'm not familiar with that one. All right, we're in. They're generating the maze. So every time you play something new, that's cool. Press any key to play. All right, let's start with level one, density one. And yeah, it's going to generate the maze. Okay, sweet. Let's see what you got, Bolo. Is it true to the source material? I wouldn't know. I'm not familiar with Bolo. All right, so I'm using Apple joystick? No. No Apple joystick. Okay, so it's keyboard only. Let's see controls. Oh, nice. Okay, so this is the WSAD keys that I'm using right now. Whenever you want to stop, you push the S. Turn left, turn right is W and D. And then if you want to move forward, you push W. And then can I push X? Yes, X makes you go backwards. And then what do we got? Space bar to shoot. Cool. Right, any other? Any cool shots? No, just one shot. Making our way around. And if you look at the screen, this is pretty impressive. This is doing, um, I'd say, top-down and diagonal scrolling screen. So th this is scrolling very impressively for the Apple II. And we have in the bottom left uh, or bottom right corner a radar. It's not helpful. It's not showing us the maze, but it shows us where our location is. Am I supposed to be shooting something, though? I don't see anybody. Are there tanks around? <laughs> Maybe because I said level one, they're making it very easy. I do have what looks like fuel on the right side. The menu that's right above my head is showing the... <laughs> as soon as I look uh, at the camera, then I see... Okay, we got somebody. Let's get him. Oh, and we can speed us up, too. So you can make yourself go faster and slower and sneak around. We can only shoot, though, it looks like at 45 degree angles. Let's see, does he shoot me? Oh, wow, he blows up, but the explosion hurts us too. And how fast can we go? Oh, this tank can move, nice. So you keep pushing W to move forward, and you just go faster and faster, even to the point that you crash into a wall. Where's our lives? Okay, it's displayed at the top. Oh, is this a base? Let's see. Whoa, no way, and it's regenerating the walls. Wow, so you find the base where the enemies are coming from and you get to blow it up? Oh, I love it. That's awesome. And the freedom to move around like this and go as fast as you want is great. Now I'm wondering, does the game stay on this screen or does it move to another area and regenerate and, and create a new, a new maze for us? Hey, hey, Bruce Hallett, thank you so much. Only Bolo gets people into subscribing. There's very minimal sound, but that's usual, usual for the Apple II. And I think because I, I selected level one, that it's so easy. At least we're not seeing a lot of enemies around. We got all this freedom, though, to move. Come to think of it, on the Apple II, we haven't seen a lot of games that incorporate a maze or radar. You know, like Defender. We've seen a couple Defender variants that do that. But this one's doing a radar in the bottom left corner fairly well. And that's something we haven't really seen on the Apple II. Most of the games have been fixed screen. Everything you see is on one screen. And look at this. We're going up, down, left, right, diagonal, all the, all the way around. Oh, we got some, we got some action. I need to slow down. Nice and easy. Find out where your base is, buddy. Now the shot, I would say, is the only thing holding this game back because <laughs> you only have 45 degree angles to shoot. And because it's using keyboard, not joystick, I would rate it. I would rate this a lot better uh, if, if this was joystick controlled. Where's that guy's base? And because you can only do, you can see. See, I'm trying to sh No, and then he blows up, and then you blow up. But it, it would give a, a little bit of practice, so I, that's minor gripes for Bolo. I still say that the fact that you're playing in a, a, a larger area, able to walk around, is awesome. Yeah, we could have done a harder difficulty, and there would be tons of enemies all over the place. We were just doing the easy one. 
So there, there could be plenty. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you could fill the whole screen with mostly enemies. I don't know how uh, you play, though. It would be very difficult with the, the shooting mechanic. All right, so Bolo, of all the games we've seen, I'm also going to say four. But then because of the control, keyboard only, no joystick, and the shot fire uh, rate, I might say three and a half. It's, uh, it's, it's still excellent. Ab above average, Bolo's r really good. Very surprising. Uh, we'll go four stars because I'm sure with practice, you uh, get the controls down and do it a little bit better. Oh, average. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, the scrolling and the larger screen than usual is uh, what really gets it. All right, let's see where we're going now. Hey, it's time to go to Japan. Our very first Game & Watch of 1982. Yes. This is Turtle Bridge. The latest in the widescreen series on Game & Watch. Finally, we haven't heard from Nintendo... Uh, or we, we, we'll be, we check it out as computers for 1982. So let's put in the palm of our hands some Game & Watch. We have the box for Turtle Bridge. Interested to see what this one's like, but it's always a treat putting a Nintendo Game & Watch in your hand, especially with handhelds. All right, so any other artwork we have for Turtle Bridge? No. So the latest in the widescreen series, I think that's all we got. All right, here we go. It's time to play some Nintendo Game & Watch. This is February 1st, 1982, and there it is. Turtle Bridge, the widescreen series. As usual, you can use the time because it's a Game & Watch, and then you have Game A and Game B. Let's check out Game A. We have only two buttons. You can see me pushing left and then right. No way. So you hop yourself across the side and then bring packages to the other end. It's the collect and deliver handheld, if you want to call that a genre. But what's interesting is it's a, <laughs> it's a platformer. And we haven't seen that on a Nintendo Game & Watch. So watch this. When I push the button, he goes in midair and then lands on the turtle. So the, the I just have to push the button once, and then he jumps in the air and lands. So it's oh, it's almost like we're doing the a jump jumping in a platform game, but very simple with the two buttons. What's really crazy is we saw the first platformer ever on a handheld with wild man jump and nintendo is the one that pretty much made that up let's they made platformers and jumping with donkey kong and so this is kind of like let's we let's get something out that we can use to compete against other pl platformers with our system the very first time i've seen a, a platform type game and as usual it's so charming executed very well where's my package the fish come up from the bottom, and if you see a fish coming, that means the turtle's ready to dive, which means you don't have a platform to jump on. You just hang out. Oh, you can get my package. Okay, go back over. And then you gotta wait for the guy. Where is he? There you go. Deliver it up. Nice. And the only difference between game A and game B is just fish are coming up a lot faster, as per the use with Game & Watch games. Alright, so we go get a new package. Make our way across. Fish is coming. And you cannot make a change with the direction you're going. So if I commit to this jump going to the left, if I push the button to the left, he hovers in midair, but that's his jump, and I can't make any decision after that. So that would be the difference and the coolest part of this one. Oh, right? Why are these on the Switch? They have to have compilations, right? There's got to be multiple of these... You can play like every Nintendo game and watch on the Switch, right? And if you work fast enough, you can get across before the turtle dives down to the fish. I know that they had a series of compilations that were on um, Game Boy Advanced and N N Nintendo DS. So I'm sure they have a modern equivalent of it. They've even modernized these. The one we're playing, it looked like this. The original was the black and white style. Oh, you can hang out here on the side? So you pick up the package, you can just stay on the left side the whole time. Okay. Yeah, Nintendo Game & Watch Gallery. That's what they called it. <laughs> All right, that is great. Now, it is 1982, and we are going to see some other Nintendo Game & Watches. Of all the ones we've seen, this one is just slightly a notch above the others. Uh, just barely. But we're going to see even better ones because the dual screens are coming out later in 82. So I'm still going to say three and a half stars. Of all the handhelds we played, it's an above average handheld. Lots of fun. 
All right, so that's the Nintendo Game & Watch. So glad to play that one. Let's see what our next game is. Something is happening. Oh, here we go. This is the Biles Toad for the Apple II. Lots and lots to go over and unpack about this game. I only heard about this game. I had no idea what I was getting into until tonight. Let's start with the box for the Biles Toad. It almost looks like an advertisement flyer. It's a unique strategy adventure when it's not a strategy adventure. The Biles Toad is the only thing worth living or dying for. I have no idea what the Biles Toad stands for. Does anyone know if that's like old English lore? It makes no sense, at least with the word. It's half reality, all nightmare. For your home. Oh, but you'll be acquainted with Biles Toad after this. Let's see the other artwork we have for the Biles Toad. So this is by Mangrove Earthshoe. <laughs> Biles Toad is by Mangrove Earthshoe. That is a pseudonym. This is really Mark Goodman that did this game. So we'll give credit to Mark, but you got to admit, Mangrove Earthshoe is awesome for a pseudonym. All right, we got the manual too, and we're going to definitely need the manual for this. Check this out. 40 bucks for the time, and I hope they marketed it well and understood what you're getting because this is this is the full package of a game for the Apple II. By Mangrove Earthshoe, can you survive the Biles Toad? Experience barbaric battles in a high-tech future, the most un unique tactical adventure ever for one or two players. This is not a tactical game. Well, partially, but it's not an adventure game either. You'll see. The Biles Toad. Oh, nice. They really did a good job on the manual as well. Looks like Martin Cannon did the work here. And this is Datamos that was publishing it. Now, check this out. The warning. This program is rated PG. It deals with violence in an explicit manner. It's not intended for children, and parents should decide whether it's suitable for small users. That's right. One of the very first ultra-violent video games is The Biles Toad. And by the way, it wasn't on the front of the box. This warning is only in the manual. If you lost the manual, you wouldn't know it, that the game's violent. All right, we'll breeze by the table of contents. The manual isn't super long, but I want everyone to see what this game's about. Life was pretty bleak by the end of the 25th century. Cities had long since grown together from overpopulation. The one city state was suffering from widespread poverty. Bored, frustrated people filled the walkways. Housing was limited and filthy. No one starved thanks to total aut automation. But not very many people lived fulfilled lives. Tension was at a peak. Mobs of people from nowhere go to go roamed around wreaking havoc on property and their fellow men. They had no jobs, no money, and nothing useful to offer a world that treated them like excess baggage. The city controller computers were worried. If trends continued on their present course, the city would be engulfed in Holocaust. The mobs were at the breaking point between frustrated apathy and psychotic violence. It was a plain that drastic change. It was plain that drastic change was needed. So the backstory of the game is this is a dystopian future where people are going to be fighting for the death. One of the first times we've ever seen a video game just make that claim. We've seen pretty crazy video game stories, but this is the first time that this claim has happened. And this, this is copied by so many games. So temporary measures were put into effect. Priority was given to the manufacturers of luxury items in the hope of a higher standard of living would lull the masses. Even in the latter half of the 25th century, computers were fairly ignorant of human psychology. Those who felt that the masses were useless burdens were aggravated by the attempt to coddle them. And those that felt bitterness towards society were appalled at the blatant attempt to treat a symptom while ignoring the disease that was infecting the entire planet. The computer analyzed their mistake and it was apparent the cause of human misery had to be eliminated. So they had to start doing extermination. The results were helpful. They discerned the reasons behind the peak of the people. They understood that man's ego demands a sense of recognition. They knew that man's aggressions, when suppressed, would blaze forth a phoenix of destruction, thus deriving the most economical and effective method of quelling the populace remained their task. They went back over human history looking for a solution. They went over the samurai and the dark ages. Everyone knew that the Biles Toad, they gave man the Biles Toad is their solution. A world stage where people could, could, could compete with each other, a place where man could succeed or fail on their own merits. Everyone knew the Biles Toad didn't really exist, not in the reality of man anyway. Still, reality is a product of perception. For the average young street thug, tucked away in a warrior's booth like a fetus in the womb, reality was not a, con a valid concern. Running for shelter, the Jaeger hot on his heels, blood oozing from the wound on his shoulder, the sweet perfume of roses mixed with the smell of fear, the salty taste of his own blood. Do you, do you understand what we're getting into? This is a, uh, a a very sinister, dark future where people are going to be fighting to the death. And not just that, it's going to be in their heads, like in a computer. So uh, this is 
taking place in the future, you hook up to a computer, which is the Biles Toad, a world of half reality, half nightmare, and you fight to the death. And when you die in the computer, you die in real life. So uh, that's what we're getting into. Biles Toad is a malevolent sort of amusement park where human nature can be vented without risking personal damage. This is accomplished by using computer simulated proxies called meatlings, which are under your control. The meatlings are classified into alignments by rank. The more highly ranked player is de designated the Jaeger. The lower ranked player is designated the Forcher. The battleground of the, the battleground of the meatlings is one of the number of islands on the world of Biles Toad. The ocean which surrounds the island serves as a natural boundary. Each island is a rectangular meadow, featureless except for a strain of weedy flowers and irregular space grid lines that mark off the island. Final elements are the Shibin, Springers, Lofters, Monstrels, and Zoninstral. So now you're acquainted with what the Biles Toad is. That's pretty extensive lore for 1982. And we have a little bit of artwork here. And then they tell you how to play the game. When the game boots up, you register your name. And so you put a name in, that's your password. And then every time you play, if you end up getting further and further with different levels, then you put in your password again and it remembers. And you have uh, higher level ranks that come up. Uh, I think that just gives you different difficulty. Let's see. Your class is the code you get whenever you uh, finish a level. So I think you believe it, begin at cl uh, class zero and then work your way up. If your input class does not match your password because of an input area or you are trying to discover a higher level group, the computer will tell you you have made an incorrect entry. You can't cheat to get higher and higher levels. Now, how do you control the meatling? The meatling's controlled with a combination of keys on the keyboard as well as buttons on the game paddles. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most obscure control schemes we've ever seen, and we've seen it all up to this point. When you play this game, if you're playing with two people, because it's two people, this is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game uh, from a top-down view, just like Warrior in the arcade. And whenever you want to play, you have to take the paddle controller and one button on one side is to move your character forward. The button on the other side moves the other character, uh, uh, the other player forward. So if you're playing two players, one person would be on one side of the keyboard, one person would be on the other side of the keyboard, and you're, you're controlling your meatlings with a keyboard, but you have to move forward pushing the button and you're sharing a paddle controller. It is bizarre. Yeah, Grandpappy of Mortal Kombat is a great way to, to break it down, so... If you want to imagine what it's like if you have a keyboard in front of you, this is how you control the characters. You have control of their body, the, uh, your axe, and your shield. And you can turn and twist both all, all the, the axe, the shield, and your body with all the controls. Two people at the same time. And I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, some more artwork to show you how epic this is. And they have hitting escape will make the game pause. So if you want to pause the game or you get really pissed off whenever your buddy's slicing your arms off, you can hit escape, slam it, and it pauses it. There's 44 islands for a total of 39 levels of beginning play. The double master game, the robot master game, and the double robot game all create new islands for continuing ex excitement. And then uh, we won't continue to the rest of the manual because that's a lot. All right, let's play some Biles Toad. This is by Mark Goodman, published by Datamost. Released at some point in the beginning of February 1982. Let's go. This game is Gore Galore. Nowhere Man presents The Biles Toad by Mangrove Earthshoe. Alright, so we have our controller plugged in. It's the paddle controller with the two buttons on either side. Let's go. Welcome to Player One Registration. So, if we start this game, let's do a two player game. Let's pretend someone else is here and it asks. Who are you? If you push return, it makes it a computer character or a robot character. So if I type in a password, I just said Chrono as my password. And then what class, if you have played before and you finished a level, you'd get a higher level class to play as. I don't know if it makes you stronger or not, but it's almost like a way to load your game. And so we'll just do level zero. Welcome to the Biles Toad. Your beginner's class code is JNO. And now we register player two. I'll do chip tune and then zero class because we don't know an another password and then their uh, code is krc so hit any key to exit registration so now we're in consult maps and hit return the next island is a uh, lift circ lsf srk and we're in we teleport in there's one meatling warped in another meatling warped in Okay, you ready? So, check this out. I'm going to move myself over to the side, because there's a lot more radar that's happening over on this side of the screen. 
at the very top right, that is the closest view of you and your character. So as you move around, that's like you uh, as close as you can to each other. Then the second map uh, in the middle is slightly zoomed out to show a few columns. And then the bottom one, the one at the very bottom right, is a very far zoomed out radar. So this game is not doing one radar. This is the very first game we've ever seen that has three radars on different magnifications. And then here's the here's the controls. This is this is crazy. If I want to move, let's say player one, this is me swinging my axe. I can move it in uh, counterclockwise or clockwise. I know it's, it's moving very slow, but I have control of that limb. What happens if I push the middle? Okay, so you just tap once to move, and if you hit the middle, it stops. And I can do the same with my shield. So blocking shield, you move your shield around, and it's taking that same top-down view like in the game Warrior in the arcade. And if you want to move your uh, character around, this is how you, you, you swivel around. So you have control of your head or torso, then you have control of your shield, and you have control of your axe. And then the same thing for the other character. They have control of their axe, and all this can be happening at the same time. So you can be moving and playing, <laughs> controlling both characters at the same time. What's nuts, though, is you're both sharing a paddle controller. So if I want to move forward, you can see this game is scrolling me as one player, and now I'm going to move farther away. You can watch how the radar... You leave the screen... Oh, and it's starting music off for us, too. Well, so when you leave the screen, the the character is still being... It, it's snapping back and forth between the two of us. So this is pushing the button to move forward as the second player, and then whenever I'm ready to move the first player, they can keep moving and walking away from each other. So it's not just a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. It's an even larger map or arena than it was in the arcade. And yes, we can chop off limbs. So we, let's make that happen. Move myself around. And then move forward. So I'm going to bring player one back. <laughs> it's doing a... Is that Furry Lease that's playing in the background? Yeah, this is February 1982. It's crazy. All right, so we're coming up. You can see us getting closer and closer on the radar. I walked really far away. I didn't have to do that. All right, now let's hack. If I get close and stop, I can start slashing. And because he doesn't have a shield on, you can see it's going to start splitting us. And I think he's going to lose the limb and blood starts coming out of the side. And obviously at this point, you should be turning around and using your shield, but we're just going to whack at the second player. Nice. Yes! We got him. Well, we didn't really fight anybody, but uh, we now go to the next island, which is Sikra. Warps us in. So this game is scrolling all directions. We have larger map area than what we see here on the screen. And now if you look, look at the far uh, bottom right. It's a top, it's almost like we're on an island, arena island. And now let's move our player to the side and whack him. Go! The only gripe I could say is it's a little slower considering, you know, fighting games we're used to now, but you kind of want it to be slower because if you're playing another friend, they're going to be needing time to move their shield and think about your attack to counter that attack. <laughs> yeah, there is nothing that tops this with blood splattered on the ground and limbs that can fall off. What's really crazy though is I would even if I had a guest tonight, I wouldn't be able to play with him because you have to have keyboard control. This is a game that you have to experience with someone else in the, the room with you. We couldn't do it remotely. Maybe there's a way I can make it work, but it it, it would take a lot. All right, so let's play as second player and see if we can make it happen now. Go forward now. No, not close enough, buddy. Got to move forward. <laughs> it's really tricky playing as two people because you have to be in control or thinking about what your uh, limbs are all doing. Oh, see, if you walk into the axe, it messes you up too. Go! 
Oh, and he got a little piece that bounced him back, too. And if you get used to the controls, you can be moving and swinging at the same time. It's just so bizarre that it has to... Uh, it has to... Uh, you, you have to share a paddle controller with the two buttons. <laughs> so this is me. I'm the second player uh, swinging around. Uh, I'm the blue player on the screen. And uh, I'm uh, literally swinging my axe in a giant circle overhead. This is the ultimate gladiator game from 1982. <laughs> yeah, and because the, the whole top-down view, most people don't consider this a fighting game. They think of it as... Uh, you know, the the side view, 2D perspective kind of games. And so this one would be forgotten because... Go, go, go! It's like Warrior. Some people don't consider Warrior in the arcade a fighting game, but it is one-on-one -on -one fighting. It's just, you know, from a, a top-down view. Kind of like Atari Boxing. Would you consider Atari Boxing a fighting game? <laughs> this is epic fighting game. <laughs> I'm just trying different things out because it's so bizarre having a character that you can control their limbs uh, individually. Uh, there's actually only the only one I can think of is Warrior in the arcade. You had the ability to take your sword and swing your sword around. So, wow. All right, so I just played a little bit of it. And by the way, you can play against the computer. The computer will tear you up. Uh, let, let's do that, actually. Did you also notice how fast the game was loading? Because you can tell it's programmed very, very well. While the movement is, is kind of slow, I was saying it was, it was my minor gripe of the game, the way this boots up, to do what it's doing is really impressive. Look, I'm in, and let's just go. Let's make, um, let's make two robots fight each other, so watch. I can just go quick, and boom. Or did I not put a second... I did, okay. So we just put two robots in the game, and now two robots are gonna go after each other. So watch the, the, the radar right above my shoulder here. So this is two AI characters on the map at the same time. I think, are they moving at the same time? Yeah, they're getting closer to one another. This is the, uh, the larger map, at least the first one is. And it's splitting back and forth between the two, which is another amazing concept. Uh, the, uh, having a game that allows two people to leave the screen and also be tracking their movements, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, he did? Oh, I gotta check that out. If he's got a higher res version of this, that must have been awesome. <laughs> An Alta Furry Lease. If you're playing chronologically gaming musical bingo of public domain songs, then add Furry Lease to the, to the list, too. <laughs> it just looks like they're dancing now to the free lease. All right, so of all the games we played, I'm, I honestly could go all the way five stars. The only thing keeping me from that is just because it, it's a little slower paced and you get more enjoyment out of playing with two people, but it still is excellent. Uh, it, it, it is obviously very polished. It is doing something we haven't seen before. Yeah, we'll go five stars. One of the best games you could play in 1982 right there. Wow. Way to go, man. Way to go, Mangrove. <laughs> what was his name again? <laughs> I need to see the box. Mangrove. Where are you? Mangrove Earthshoe. We'll just refer to him as Mangrove Earthshoe. All right, now, who knows what's going to be next after that one. We're still on the Apple II, and this is Star Blazer. Let's check out Star Blazer. I don't know, after Biles Toe, this one's going to be probably mediocre. Let's take a look at the box for Star Blazer. This is by Broderbund, a high-res action game by Tony Suzuki. Way to go, Tony. There's evil on the loose, and men and women of goodwill are on the run. It's doing the crawl like in Star Wars. Your mission's not an easy one. Designed and coded by Tony Suzuki. You need 48K again. Gosh, shell out all the money for RAM this year. <laughs> yes, truly was the game of the night. Any other artwork we have for Star Blazer? Looks like... No, not much. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk we'll be popping in. All right, let's check out Star Blazer. The latest by Broderbund. At the beginning of February 1982. Okay, so we got keyboard controls. I'll still try the joystick and see if it works. Okay, control C uses the joystick. Oh, are we in or is this a track mode? Star Blazer. 
by Tony Suzuki. No, it is track mode. Okay, cool. Let's see. Space party goes. They're giving us a mission. Bomb the radar. Now, we didn't get a manual on this, and the instructions just were telling us controls. Now, I am able to go... Why am I only going left and... I'm only able to go left and right right now. I'm wondering why, because we just played... I wonder if the Biles Toad controls have messed up this one, because all I'm able to do is... Here, let's try it this way. No, paddles aren't working either. But the controls are... Well, we'll probably use the keyboard then. Oh, there it is. <laughs> As we get shot down. Or no, after we lose our fuel. So a horizontally scrolling shooting game. Let's see if we can go again. There we go. All right, so yeah, con uh, c controls weren't working exactly as they were supposed to on the Apple Paddle controls, but they did say maybe it's Control C. Let's see if that works. There it is. Okay, yeah, we just had to hit Control C. Got it. Now the controls are good. It was on keyboard control. So now if we see the game is played from a side view. Now what's interesting though is my shot only have one button. And it's firing a laser and I'm continuing to fire the shot but then sometimes it fires bombs. But I don't know why it fires bombs or laser. Because my objective is to bomb the radar. Oh, and crashed out of fuel. <laughs> it's little farts every shot. That's usual sound effects of Apple II. Remember, it's a system that started in 1977. You gotta give it some credit. It does feel like someone making um, fart sounds with their mouth, though. Oh, is it just getting... Oh, nice! Okay, watch the, watch the plane. When you move to the bottom, it opens up the, sh the chute at the bottom. And that's how you bomb the radar. You wait for it to open up and then bomb. All right, where's my fuel? Let's see. I think that was the radar, but it's kind of cool that the game's giving an objective to do. Nice. All right, looking good. Okay, so it makes sense. There is only one button. It's a laser button to fire, but whenever you move close to the bottom, then it opens up the chute. There, that a bomb the radar? It looked like a radar to me. Mission one complete. Wow, I feel so accomplished. They give us a mission to complete rather than just shooting everything. Oh, and then we're out of fuel on the next level. Great. It also, notice how the plane is giving you a little nuance moving up and down, like uh, it rotates a little as you as you fly up, up and down on the screen. All right, now we're in. Con controls are set. We're ready for joystick. We know we got to get fuel. We can bomb the radar. Let's do it. Looking for the radar. Don't see it yet. See, if I move up and down, it gives a slight movement of the plane. Or maybe that was just the, the chute opening at the bottom. Come on, where's that radar at? We're going to run out of fuel. I actually don't know which one's fuel. I'm bombing these. I'm used to scramble, but it's not raising my fuel to... Yeah, where is the fuel one? I'll just keep bombing everything and see. That one wasn't it. Oh, there's a radar. Bomb it. No, we missed the radar. Oh, we did do it. Okay, we must have bombed off the screen. Yeah, this isn't the typical game. It's very good for 1982. Oh, and we did run out of fuel. So all I would need to know is give me a manual. Let me know where the fuel is. And then we got this game in the bag. So I wouldn't fault it for that. I mean, we're just booting these up for the first time playing them. Who knows what'll happen? So now we're doing attack the tank, like it's a boss. Oh, he ran away from us? Come here, come back here. Can we sh oh, we can't go any lower than this. So you can't fire your shot straight ahead. I wonder if we have to bait them. Lead them back here and then go for attacks there. 
So you pull back all the way and then get them to come out and then bomb. <laughs> While dodging the planes at the top of the screen. Nice. Yeah, I shot one of the packages. It didn't do anything. Come on. Or at least it didn't see the fuel go up whenever that happened. Oh no, we're out of bombs. Not good. I wonder if we shoot planes down and then... It... No, it doesn't drop any debris there. But that's a great idea. Having a shooter giving you objectives and missions to do. We played games that have new levels to check out, but not something that's giving us an actual uh, objective to complete before going to the next level. That's that's ahead of its time. Anything? Nope. Come on. And now they're giving us a boss that's trying to be tricky with us. Yeah, another game that it's not just a pick up and play. I would want to keep going and see the other missions. So um, for the time, I'm definitely going to say three and a half stars. Horizontally scrolling shooter that gives you missions to go from. That's, that's awesome. I love it. Yeah. All right. So there you go. That is the end of our evening this time. We're in February 1982 playing every single game. We'll continue next time playing all the games. Nothing will be left behind. What a cool idea for Biles Toad. I love it. All right, so that's it for today. And like I always say, you don't mess with Mangrove Earthshoe. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central. So join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.